baseball to me is very tied to nostalgia. I'm not sure why that is. I guess partially because baseball was the first sport that I stood out in, in Little League. Uh, also, I was a baseball card collector. You know, I traded, flipped and flung them in grammar school. Mm. Also, it seems to me that my childhood, which went through the 1970s into the 1980s, it's my impression at least that during that period, baseball went from being sort of the most prominent, relevant, important sport in America to then sharing that protagonism with football and basketball. Uh, you know, I grew up in New York City and sometimes or suddenly, you know, names like Roger Staubach, Tony Dorsett from teams as far away as Dallas or, you know, Terry Bradshaw and Mean Joe Green from teams as far away as Pittsburgh. And then, you know, later the rivalry between the Los Angeles Lakers with Magic Johnson and uh, the Boston Celtics with Larry Bird. And then, of course, the phenomenon with Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls. Um, also, perhaps the link to nostalgia has to do with baseball's link to history, at least in America, because it seemed to me that baseball came to the forefront of the American stage just about the same time as the United States came to the forefront of the world stage. And so, um, you know, baseball reflected and influenced, had repercussions in American cultural life in general. And suddenly that seemed to stop. That was my impression, you know. I don't know. Uh, baseball diamonds and baseball backstops, at least in urban areas, suddenly, suddenly stopped being utilized. Uh, American blacks seem to abandon the sport. Um, so perhaps, you know, baseball's link to nostalgia has something to do with um, its loss of total protagonism in American culture. The two books that I'm going to discuss today are about when baseball was still the you know, most relevant, most important sport in America. The first book is a recognized classic. Um, Roger Kahn's The Boys of Summer, published in 1972 about the great uh, Brooklyn Dodgers team from the 1950s. Mm. And uh, it's gone through many, many editions. Mm. Roger Kahn died in 2020. And the other book I'm going to talk about is not yet considered a classic, but I think it will be and should be, which is Cardboard Gods, an American Tale Told Through Baseball Cards by uh, Josh Wilker. It was published by Seven Footer Press in 2010 and then was later picked up by Algonquin Books in 2011. Josh Wilker is, I think, my age or maybe one year younger. I, like Roger Kahn and Josh Wilker, considered ballplayers gods and they influenced me to at least attempt to do something important with my life um, so yeah that's the reason for choosing these books so Khan writes about growing up a trolley ride away from Ebbets Field the Dodgers were named or the name comes from the term trolley Dodger which doesn't really make sense in LA, but it made a lot of sense in Brooklyn. He grew up in a family of first and second generation immigrants with intellectual pretensions. His mother was a school teacher and his father I think was too, and then later became or wrote scripts for radio programs. Um, his mother wanted her son Roger to think of about things of consequence. She didn't consider baseball in that category, but he writes that the bond between him and his father was baseball. He, his father apparently 
played for City College in the early 1920s, although later when he becomes a reporter, he says he didn't have the heart to check if it was true. Um, he talks, he writes very, very well about the first time that his father brought him to a game at Ebbets Field and he sees the Brooklyn third baseman at the time, a guy named Jersey Joe Strip, make a diving grab at third base, roll over twice and not drop the ball. He writes, um, he writes, in the dead sunlight of a forgotten spring, the major leaguers were trim, graceful, and effortless. They might even have been gods to a boy who wanted to become a man and who sensed that it was a manly, exalted thing to catch a ball with your arm thrust across your body and make a crowd leap to its feet and cheer. Talking about writers considering ball players gods and just so you get a taste of Khan's prose when he's hitting on all cylinders. So, he grows up in Brooklyn and then at 24 years old, he becomes the beat writer for the Brooklyn Dodgers, working for the New York Herald Tribune. He's 24 years old. So in the 1952 and 1953 seasons, when the Brooklyn Dodgers went all the way to the World Series and lost both times to the New York Yankees, Roger Kahn is traveling with the team and forming and forging relationships with, for example, the indisputable star of that team, Jackie Robinson, who was the first black player to play in the major leagues, um, a revolutionary player, okay? There was also Pee Wee Reese, who was the captain of that team. There was the slugger Duke Snyder. There was Gil Hodges. There was um, Carl Ferrillo. There was Roy Campanella, the catcher. There was Joe Black, who was the first black guy to win a World Series game as a pitcher, right? He's forging relationships with all these guys on a daily basis, talking to them, bantering with them. He's got a fantastic ear for dialogue. He not only banters with them, but he banters with his newspaper competition. If you can imagine, there were three baseball teams in New York at that time. The New York Giants, right? The Brooklyn Dodgers and the New York Yankees, okay? So all of these newspapers, there are four or five at the time, right? All of them have beat reporters for each of these teams. They're trying to scoop each other. He captures all that. He captures like the voice of Red Barber, who was the radio announcer for the team. I mean, it's just brilliant the way he does it. His ear is just fantastic. And so all of this, all of these relationships that he forges then allow him to remain sort of on equal status with these players 20 years later in 1970, which is when he decides or when he realizes that traveling with this team is not something to be dismissed. He goes and meets with these players, all of these players to see what they're doing now, okay? And so there is this strain of nostalgia because none of these players are what they once were in their glory years, obviously now. The Brooklyn Dodgers no longer exist, okay? Because Khan left the newspaper business in 1954. According to Khan, that Brooklyn team finally won a World Series in 1955, but after their prime. In 1956, Jackie Robinson retired. In 1958, the Brooklyn Dodgers left for LA. And in 1960, Ebbets Field, which was an institution all to itself, was demolished and then ultimately turned into the Jackie Robinson houses. So that strain of nostalgia, okay, of him basically getting to know these gods and then seeing them sort of like be thrown out of their Olympian realms, right? and 
basically converted into uh, mere mortals, okay? Strikes a chord, or will strike a chord, I think, with any reader from any generation. One of the things that's interesting to me is that Roger Kahn's book about baseball and about, you know, interacting with these gods is written from the inside. Roger Kahn is clearly an insider, okay? Meanwhile, okay, Josh Wilker, who grew up sort of in this unconventional household with this hippie mother and this kind of office working father who was older than his mother, uh, up in Vermont after his mother and her lover kind of escaped to live in this idealistic world they imagine they can create in, you know, the, the sort of rural paradise of Vermont, but it never works out. So he's living in this kind of different alienated world, unconventional world, like perceiving the baseball world from these baseball cards that he buys in the local store. So he's writing about baseball or his perspective of baseball and of these gods from the perspective of the outsider. So that difference, the insider and the outsider, makes it very, very interesting to read both these books at the same time. Okay, Cardboard Gods by Josh Wilker. Wilker collected baseball cards from 1974 to 1981. I think those are the years of the baseball cards in his book. That's when I collected them. So I should just stay right off the bat that I started reading this book and I was immediately awash in nostalgia, just choking up by just looking at these cards. I have the first edition and so, you know, each chapter or section is set off by a particular card in color. And I recognize those cards from my collection. And so, you know, I'm back being a kid looking at cards just like he did and um, so again there is the strain of nostalgia running through cardboard gods just like there's a strain of nostalgia running through the boys of summer it's impressive that you know josh wilker can basically look at these cards meditate on these cards and string a story together with these meditations and reflections and how these players represent certain moments in his childhood, adolescence, and then young manhood. Some examples, okay? Kent DeColvey, who was a finisher for the world championship Pittsburgh Pirates, that great team with Willie Stargell, Dave Parker, which had as its team song, We Are Family by Sister Sledge. I mean, here's Kent DeColvey, this kind of dweeby, dorky looking guy coming in and finishing for them. And, um, you know, there's a line, as I say, because this book is about sort of the, the outsider, uh, about the loner, just this line, check out this line. It's when he's speaking about T Kent DeColvey. This is the fantasy of all real loners, that the world that has shunned them and that they have shunned will come to them desperate for help, okay? This is Josh Wilker in the book, the loner, the outsider, who sees in Kent DeColvey hope. Or, for example, the Ricky Henderson card from 1980, okay? He talks about how Ricky Henderson, who became one of the greatest ball players of all time, just a revolutionary player, right? Hit for power, hit for average, you know, stole bases, could, you know, completely change games. When he came into the league in 1979, right, of the first 29 games that he played for the Oakland A's, right, he lost 25 of them, okay? And so there's the card of Ricky Henderson in his very unconventional stance, you know, just looking ready to spring, right? And mm, 
the Josh Wilker line in the book is that that Ricky Henderson is about to treat the next pitch, the next moment, as if it could not be more important. Again, so these great ball players are encouraging him through these moments in his life where, as he describes it, hoping that the door will open and his life will begin, right? He writes very, very well about living in limbo, about living a stagnant life. It's never boring, the book, okay? Some people call it funny. I wouldn't say it's funny, really. I think it's more like opportune. It's like delightful. He's never trying to be overtly or overwroughtly creative or clever. It stands out for being genuine. It is so tremendously genuine. Another example, J.R. Richard, who was this six foot eight fireballer for uh, the Houston Astros. And, you know, he spent his early 20s and mid 20s like trying to find the plate and then suddenly he like found it and he was basically unhittable. And at this point in the story, Josh Wilker is, you know, dreaming of being the next Kerouac, of writing a novel that'll pull him out of, you know, uh, his, you know, uh, obscurity and uh, lack of purpose. Um, and he writes or dreams about, quote, that awesome power lurking inside him finally bloomed. Or, I don't know, also there's Doc Ellis, who also pitched for the Pirates, who pitched a no-hitter when he was high on acid. And so Josh Wilker talks about his own bad acid trip, and I'm paraphrasing, but he talks about how, you know, you know, it, before you're born, you're one with the universe. After you die, you're one with the universe. But, but when you're alive, you're like a piece of the whole that's loose and is falling, and a chunk of flesh plunging through the dark. I mean, that's really what he is all throughout the book. This chunk of flesh plunging through the dark. The only time he ever fits in is when he hits a homer when he's 12 years old in Little League. It's a great moment when he describes that. Um, but there's a moment at the end of the book where he talks about why he ended up writing. He talks about his desire to make his thin, meandering life as meaningful as something in a book. But then he makes this other connection, which struck a chord with me. He talks about how he started writing for the same reasons that the Hudson River School of Painters from the 19th century began, as he said, creating giant romantic canvases depicting untrammeled American wilderness at the very moment that wilderness was beginning to disappear. If you substitute untrammeled American wilderness or wilderness with baseball, that's what I think Josh Wilker is doing. He's creating this giant romantic canvas of baseball, just as baseball or the cultural phenomenon of baseball was beginning to disappear. I think that's why the book especially struck a chord with me. That's why I feel like he's telling my story, which is, I think, the ultimate goal of every memoirist. So yeah, I think these two books speak to what it means to be raised on baseball with an important generational difference, okay? And also from the difference 
of being an insider in Roger Kahn's case and being an outsider in Josh Wilker's case. Um, I think the books are fascinating to read together. Um, and I really do hope that Josh Wilker's book earns the status of classic one day because I think it deserves it. It's certainly a classic in my mind.